You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. Boop. Uh, I'll let you start it. Hey, Jeepers. Welcome to show 211 with On the Trail of... With, uh, try that one again here. <laughs> Hi, Jeepers. Welcome to show 211 of On the Trail with Kevin and Scott. I'm Kevin, the engineer, you know, the guy that reads instructions, uses the right tools, and generally follows those instructions. And if I choose to vary a little bit from that instructions, I know I'm responsible for the results. And sitting across me, the electronic table is... I am Scott. I am the slapstick sparse guy that continually can, tries to remember the beginning and the intro of this show. But unfortunately, sometimes I just, like the instructions, can't decide to decide to read them. And then I start adding double syllables to what is going on here, man. I need either A, more caffeine, or B, less. And welcome enjoying our show. And as always, Kevin and I will share what we choose to do with the instructions. But make sure you read them. And I'm trying to... Uh, how did I do this again, Kevin? Let's see here. Yeah, you're doing it, but the, the key point here is don't <laughs> let the mar- don't let the market or other people tell you what you want to do with your Jeep. Do what you want to do with your Jeep and be happy with it. So, Thank you. And we do ask you to please you know, read and follow the instructions. The, uh, the manufacturers did put a lot of effort in it, unless you're getting the one that says Henshe in China. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> oh, my sense. eyes twitching at work. We did a Sequoia lift. Oh, uh, the instructions. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah, no, that I, was. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And yes, the mixture of languages was intentional, folks. So please don't email me about the use of Mexican and <laughs> <laughs> distorted English. Oh, you know, <laughs> uh, that will be a subject of this show in a little bit. Oh, that I can actually jump right off because again, Kevin and I always wonder what we're going to talk about on the show. And I have to say, right from the very beginning, I just realized something. I took our own advice when we did said lift kit on the Sequoia. I uh, we got some uh, wheel adapters. Uh, because the customer wanted to use factory wheels. And right. so we, you know, of course, I wasn't in the ordering process. Of course, we got the wrong ones from a certain company. Well, I remember the company I used back when we had the JK. So yeah. I called the manufacturer and said, hey, I got this lug nut style, this. And they go, yep, you need this and this. Measure this over here, and we'll sell them to you out there. And I did. So when Kevin and I talk about calling the manufacturers, if you have an issue, please do. I look like the hero with my boss, with the exception of the $168 overnight freight shipping from Colorado. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> but at the end of the day, though, the customer got their vehicle back. So, again, Kevin and I always the tell way you. They wanted it. Exactly. Kevin and I always talk to you about reading these instructions, check these things, and call these manufacturers when you have a question because it really, really, really does work. And I want to give a shout out to the guys over at Spider Tracks because they were able to answer my questions and tell me exactly what I needed. And I got everything taken care of. Again, not a sponsor of the show. I was at work when I did this, but please call those manufacturers. They want you all to be happy with your purchases. They really do. They don't get a benefit from you be, you buying a product and then being unhappy with it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's a good thing. And we've met a whole bunch of those manufacturers out <laughs> yes. there over the last eight years. Eight years. Um, so anywho, do you wish to start off on your topic that you were bringing up? Uh, kind of, I can't remember the topic, but I'll go into the one I is cool, okay. fresh off my mind. And that is, you know, Ke- Kevin and I, if y'all are, are aware, we live down here in the swamp, uh, the, the South, um, back yeah. where, you know, the gators are the size of mosquitoes and mosquitoes are the size of, you know, uh, Santa Ana cranes. The gators are the size of mosquitoes. I'm sorry. The one I saw crossing <laughs> the road in front of me was more like an engine and transmission combo out of a, uh, straight six TJ. You know, <laughs> long, and it kind of gave me a look as it was going across. And Susan's about freaked out. She goes, "What the who?" It was only about a mile and a half from the house, <laughs> and it's kind of looking at us with a, "You wait for me, buddy." You understand? <laughs> you look pink and delicious, uh, but <laughs> and no. I don't need ketchup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm a bit spicy because we all know my hot sauce addiction. But so, anyways, we're down here in the south, and it's already what July, Kevin, and already the temperature out there is a uh, uh, thousand degrees centigrade. Um, but uh, that's what it feels like. And it, it, everyone's, it's yeah. a joke. When you're, if just if Floridians know, you walk from the front door to the mailbox and come back, and you need a shower. But anyways. So, uh, I, you know, again, the LJ, you know, we all know I've been driving the LJ some more lately. And uh, I jumped in the LJ and, you know, going to work's fine. The air conditioner's nice and cold. Everything's going good. I'm like, this is nice. I love this Jeep, blah, blah, blah. Stirring through the gears, enjoying life, you know, the wind through my hairs. And I get to work and I park my Jeep out in the sun. 
Mm-hmm. It's time to go home, and you know it's 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 you know feels like 115 degrees, and I'm not over exaggerating on that one. Some no, days it does feel that the, way. They call it feel real feel temperature. Yeah, and we're not even August yet. Oof. But anyways, so I get in the Jeep, and of course, you know, I do like Kevin does. Open the crack, crack open the oven, the oven, let it air out for a few minutes, roll the windows down. AC on uh, max, but, you know, let's get the hot air out. And so I'm driving home, and I get about a three-mile to four-mile drive home, okay? Mm -hmm. By the time I get home, the air's just now getting cold in the Jeep. And I'm like, man, do I got a pressure problem? I check my refrigerant levels. Everything's fine. Something's wrong here. This just isn't right. So I was telling Kevin this the other day. I can lean back and, you know, we always talk about, you know, uh, taking time to research a problem and realize and, and, and do these things and not jump to conclusions or fire a parts cannon. So that's why I was looking at compressors just in case my compressor was bad. And then I'm le- I leave work one day and I had to reach behind the seat and my arm hits the giant storage blocker that I have in the back passenger compartment, the giant black steel box. Flat black, no less. Flat black. And as my arm cauterizes to the box, <laughs> I was like, I could fry a steak on this thing or an egg or whatever kind of meat you want to cook. And I'm like, I think there's my problem. So I You found one spot of shade. You said, you said. Oh, dude, I had to winch the Honda out of there so I could have the shady spot. So I backed the Jeep into the shady spot so that so that in the afternoon, the, the hard top's not getting hit with the sun. It's still a little warm, but not as bad. Touch the metal. Okay, you know, I, I could cook an egg, but not, you know, it'd take a good hour to cook a steak on it. Roll the windows down, do the same thing. About two miles from, no, about two minutes from the work, I roll the windows back up. Now I got cold air. So... If you do have AC problems with some of your vehicles, make sure you're not huggling on a gigantic heat-soaked heat sink in the back of your vehicle. Yeah. Just you, you two could, cents. You, he could probably do pizza delivery, and it would arrive hotter than when it came out of the oven in the store. <laughs> Put it in raw, come out baked. I was just like, you kidding me? Again, sometimes the simplest things escape us, you know, because, again, you know, again, sometimes, you know, like me, you get to the worst-case scenario. But I was just like floored by how something so simple. And you know, Kevin gave me a couple ideas, throwing a towel over it or you know something like yeah, that. Just a white towel or a light color at the least, just to knock off the solar absorption. Yeah. So I'm gonna try but, you that know, next. While we were talking about air conditioning, <clears throat> this leads into some something I just learned out about, and uh, this blew my mind, folks. And maybe you know about it. If you're definitely in the automotive industry, um, you are aware of this. But the problem is what's happening on the aftermarket side that I didn't realize was so rampant. As you all know, 134A refrigerant, which was provided in most of the 2000s years, we didn't go to the to the later ones till probably 2015, 2016, as I think, Scott. Uh, I think some, st- some was early as 12, but some were a little later. Well, 134 started in the, in the early 90s, early early to mid-90s, because um, I remember okay. my, my 94 Ranger was 134A. Okay. I remember that. <laughs> so, but 134A is on the list of bye-byes, you know. Yeah. Uh, you can still get it, but you pay for it, okay? Mm-hmm. You pay quite a bit for it. And what you're going to start seeing out here is a whole bunch of things. If you go into your local parts store, you go on Amazon, you go on eBay, uh, you're going to see a whole lot of them that say 134A. But you really have to look close because down in the small print, it'll say substitute. And is that critical? Well, I watched a couple of reports and videos on the material and Number one, it is not as efficient, okay? We're talking about most Freon systems here in Florida, the 134As will give you about 42 to 44 degrees output air as a general rule of thumb, even with the temperature outside in the 90 pluses. However, the other material, I'll just use that term for it for the moment, is only going to give you about 48, 49, may not even make 50, and that can get pretty uncomfortable. But you know what? I could live with that, except for it has a really big problem, and that is simply that the primary constituent of this substitute is propane. Oof. And my first thought when I heard that was like, you're kidding me. So I went and started reading about them, and they are indeed a a conglomerate of propane and a few other things. Because propane, we've talked about air conditioning before, and it's a phase chain st- uh, – a phase changing material it can go from gas 
to liquid and back again under the pressures and radiator systems that we have in an air conditioner. In other words, you get hot gas compressed by the compressor. It will go into the condenser out at the front of your Jeep where the air blowing on it will cause it to cool. It literally rains inside that radiator and liquid Freon collects at the bottom and is blown out is the best way to think of it by the compressor pushing all the hot gas in at the top. And then it goes into a dryer or an accumulator, it's called both, and it does both jobs. And then from there, it goes through <laughs> a spray nozzle. Uh, it's called an orifice valve in the pipe, but it's basically the same kind of a nozzle that you have in your spray deodorant or your spray paint or your spray anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and that immediately, on the other side of that orifice, it's a lower pressure because that's where the pump is pulling from. And it vaporizes. And when you have a phase state change from a liquid to a gas, an expansion, it needs heat. So it will absorb heat. Well, guess what comes right after you go through that orifice? Your evaporator core in your cab. And mm -hmm. that's where you get that cold temperature that the air blows across the radiator. And now you have a lukewarm gas that heads on out and heads over to the compressor to get squeezed up and be a hot pressure gas. Yeah. So you need a material that can do that continuous cycle of compression, cooling, liquefaction, then... Uh, controlled evaporation through the orifice valve into a high area of temperature called your uh, eva your um, evaporator, yeah, and uh, start the cycle all over again. Um, now, yeah, I, you know, I get it. I understand the challenges that we have, but here's the problem. Just imagine, if you will, that you run into a tree on a trail, another Jeep, or God forbid you have a head-on collision uh, or run into something uh, driving down the road. You have a tank of propane up front that's already in a fragile radiator. Yes. Um, and it isn't going to take much of a leak in a source of ignition to, to, to flambe the entire front of your Jeep or possibly you since the f internal unit is inside your cab. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, personally, you guys can make your own decisions. It hasn't been shot down by any federal agency at this point because even the newer stuff what's the number John, uh, Scott uh, one two three four yf that's what I thought one two three four is also a propane derivative but uh, uh, I don't think that it's a as big a volume and is flammable but uh, the other stuff I watched a project farm video as a gentleman who does a lot of the testing and he actually went out there and popped open a can near an ignition source out in the back field just to see what would happen. And it was a pretty impressive, you know, <laughs> uh, fireball, so fireball. <laughs> the thing is I'm trying to get through for you to, to you as our listeners. A lot of you do have, you know, the older, um, uh, CJs, TJs, YJs that have the, um, 134A. Mm -hmm. And if you go in there to try and use it and you, you see that cheaper, it's okay if you know you're buying the propane derivative, but if you don't, you could find out. And you're really not supposed to mix the two, by the way. You're not supposed to mix. So if you add your propane as a top-off onto a 134A, you can actually end up with a pretty explosive or at least easily ignited mix. Well, that's the thing, too. Like, uh, when, and, and honestly, when you have like the R12 and R1234YF, one, R one, two, three, four, YF, the R12s will use either PAG or ester, and then the other way around, um, you, actually it's a new Hypoi uh, kind of oil, not Hypoi gear oil, but it's like a HYOP, I can't remember the uh, the label that was on the compressor I sold over the counter. But um, so even like with that propane, you know, will the propane negatively affect the ester or and or PAG oils that are inside the compressors? The other thing too, Kevin might be able to tell me more on this, and I just this just, just popped in my head, if it is truly a propane derivative, should it have the fl flammable placard on the back of the can? Well, I think it should because it was obviously flammable in the tests I saw. Right. But I don't know that it actually was. Okay. okay. I, cause you, you, I never saw the can up close. It could be. Uh, I just want our listenership to be aware that you'll see a can and it'll say R134A. You know, and you're going to go, oh, that's what I need. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you don't pick up the can and look, if it, let's put it this way, the easiest way to know it is, uh, at least here, 134A original, if you can find it, is 14 to $16 a can. Right. And the other stuff is 7 to 9 
I'm going to bet you the sevens guaranteeing is a substitute. Yeah. Uh, and unless you have the equipment to actually recover what's in your system, your original system to get the material out and that you take it down to, uh, let's say 500 microns, um, so that you're completely, you know, you're not leaving anything else in there and then you can recharge it in my book. That's still driving around with a bomb. You know, let, let me, yeah. let me tie a couple of propane cylinders to the front bumper of my Jeep, <laughs> just in case I bump, you know, the parking bollards. Uh, You'd no, be more than I'm slightly altered. <laughs> yeah. I, I realize I, I'm being a little hyperbole here. Yeah, but absolutely. Just, the thing here is be aware. That's all I'm saying. You know, you may look at it and go, yeah, I think it's still a good idea. Fine. But at least you made that decision fully informed. Yeah. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, me, I'm going to keep scrabbling around and buying the the uh, 134A as long as I can. And then if after that, I'll look at what I'm going to convert to. I'm not going to put a propane substitute in my Jeep. I'm sorry. I do too many weird things to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the other thing, too. Like when it comes to the 1234YF, uh, that's sold in grams. And what's interesting about this, and again, I've, I, I've, I started my business, my career in auto parts when it was R12. And you had to have the blank, uh, the, the book and sign it. You had to have your card, your yep. max card and all that. And I, and again, I saw what they had like the R12 substitutes and I saw, <laughs> I love those cause those were the days where I was selling lots of compressors <laughs> cause you know, the substitutes usually don't work very well, but no, the um, bearings went out cause you couldn't carry the lubricant the same way. Right. But again, you could, a lot of people did convert the R12 systems successfully to 134. So there are conversions. Yep. And again, you know, I remember when R12 was, you know, $3 a can, you know, matter of fact, the can I have, the super tech refrigerant that's in the back of the LJ right now, I bought from Walmart 2019, no, 2020 yeah. is still, you know, and it's because I, I, again, that's how much I use. It. It's like the occasional top off. That's it. But, um, no, it, again, it was, it was actual, you know, um, uh, R134, but when I looked at, you know, grab a couple other cans just because, you know, I'd like to have it around just in case, you know, it was like, you know, 15 to $18 a can. I'm like, oof, that's, that, that went up. But again, now Kevin's kind of making that, making sense about how, you know, it's now one, two, three, four YF. And the very interesting thing is now here's some sticker shock. If you have the one, two, three, four YF, that's expensive. It's almost R12 price because yep. I price it every day and a typical charge, which is like some gram number that I have no idea. We just, it's $300 to charge your AC now. Yeah, but that's in, with labor. But yeah. still, yeah. Well, it's uh, just the refrigerant alone is $178. Yeah. No, I believe that. You could buy a 30, you used to be able to buy a 30 pounder of 134 for that, you know, and I, I actually purchased a, a Ten pound because you know they're not thirty pound cylinders. They're ten pound cylinders of one, two, three, four YF, mm -hmm. fourteen hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. That is insanity. But that's the future. That's where it's going because you know it, we also haven't had a single. I haven't seen a news broadcast about the ozone layer in years. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why. Uh, yeah. You know, it's one of the few successes in the environmental world that is clearly. Uh, demonstrated. So. Yeah. So it, it, it's all there for a reason. Um, yep. And the other thing too, on a quick little, uh, just, uh, diatribe Side, um, sidebar, <laughs> sidebar, but not sidebar. Um, we saw, an, I saw another post again about hollowing out cats and please don't do it folks. We had that conversation last show. And again, Kevin and I are, if you have state inspections or what, we're not going to tell you what to do, but at the same time, like Kevin just brought up about this again, this isn't a political show, so we're not going to go too far down this road, but Again, guys, you know, I like clean air and water. I like going outside and going <sighs> and not coughing up a, you know, charcoal lung bit. So and a lot of you weren't around in the areas where we actually had the most <clears throat> polychromatic sunsets mm -hmm. due to smog. And I was, and I'm surprised I'm still alive and breathing and not dead from it. Yeah. I know a lot of people who did suffer from it. So, yeah, I'm sorry. You, you can count me on that, leaning on that side of the environmentalists. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That, uh, like Scott said, I like clean water, I like clean air. So, but that's just me personally. Yeah. So we won't go too much further on that, but we wanted, we wanted to touch on that. But other thing too, again, when Kevin and I, cause it is summertime, um, again, we always kind of talk about this every year, you know, you make sure your tires are the correct pressure, you know, check your cooling systems. I've mm -hmm. seen three or four posts now with TJ's blowing the top of the radiator off. 
You know, I, I, yep. I don't know if there's a way to check for cracks. Again, I just, I, I have an aluminum radiator. Kevin runs an aluminum radiator and everyone's like, oh, don't do it. It's terrible. Well, I've, I've, I've ran mine for two years now. No problems. No, but um, <clears throat> Like any radiator, it depends on who made it and who you bought it from, what condition it is. Yes. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong in my book with a solid aluminum welded radiator. Uh, but, uh, and I don't necessarily have to buy the most expensive Mishimoto radiator out there. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, a well-made plastic housed, you know, with the aluminum core mm -hmm. is probably good for a reasonable amount. But think of the age of your YJs and TJs. Okay. Plastic has a finite lifespan. Aluminum, not so much. It does have a lifespan, but it's probably on orders of magnitude <laughs> multipliers yeah. of what a plastic one is. I had two of the plastic radiators. Uh, <clears throat> one went out to, on me, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, it also split the little, uh, the edge, there's a little flange at the bottom of the top tank. It's got a bunch of little aluminum crimps beat over, bent, bent over on it to hold it down. And those little crimps started popping on mine, and it started eventually leaking, so I bought another one. And that one split the, the header entirely, just split open along the uh, the mold line. So I went ahead and said, hmm, I'm going to get the aluminum one. And everybody was like, oh, you know, it's going to gonna leak. It's going to leak. It didn't leak, and it's still running to this day. And it's mm -hmm. been in place now for probably seven years, which beats every one of the other records. <laughs> <laughs> but, again, I did not buy the uh, Amazon cheapy, you know, that the box is labeled with uh, indecipherable Cantonese, you know. Mine or, was Mandarin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have been. I bought the cheap Amazon one because we all know I squeak. And the good news is it didn't last a year in the garage. I was put in immediately. I, I think I paid like 230 for mine. So I didn't buy the $100 one. I actually bought the 231 And so far, so good. Knock on wood. I mean, so. <laughs> and let's be, the, the first thing I tell you guys is, Go check your radiator hoses. Um, a lot of times the leak is actually in the hoses or in the cap. Yeah. Here, here's a new shocker, folks. Caps are a wear item. Radiator caps are considered a wear item, serviceable and replaceable. And if you do that, <laughs> make sure you find out what your pressure is. Mine is a 14 PSI cap, which is pretty common, mm -hmm. but not all of them are. Some of them are 16 to 18. You know, and uh, <clears throat> don't think that excuse me, going with a higher pressure cap is a good thing because guess what will happen? You blow out your seals on your water pump. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess that's just me preaching again. Servicing in a reasonable means and methods in accordance with the manufacturer's recommended service policy will get you the maximum lifespan out of your parts. Go ahead, Scott. You, well, you're over there just chomping at the bit. Well, no, I, just, I got a question to ask you. And, and here's we had a technician ask for the be cool, uh, like a water wetter kind of stuff. Correct. Now, I like use a red line water wetter. Yeah. Those things. I, now, back many cars ago, I used water wetter in my car. And, you know, because, again, I, I idled it a lot, you know, on lunch breaks. And, again, this was 1999, guys. This is, this is before I had the Jeep. But, and so what are, your, uh, what are your thoughts on products like that? Because I saw a scary video because, again, the Internet's full of scary videos. You know, don't use these products. And gel was coming out of the guy's radiator. But we don't know what their gel? condition. Oh, yeah, it gelled up. But we don't know the condition uh -huh. of the radiator. We don't know if they used the wrong cool. And it could have been a on. fake video. What are yeah. your thoughts on some of those products, like the water wetters or, you know? Okay. First off, I actually run Redline uh, water additive in the radiator on the TJ. Okay. And the reason I chose to do that, number one, cast iron blocks are very good at wetting out. They're actually porous. So the water can wet them out, all right, and pull heat out very, very well. Aluminum is less so, okay? Aluminum immediately corrodes. I mean... By the time you take a machine, a fresh surface on aluminum, and take it out of the machine and walk it over and set it on the desk, it has oxidized into a glass-like layer, just only a couple of molecules thick, that insulate the aluminum from the contact of water. So all, all a water wetter is, like the red line, is it helps the uh, lower the viscosity of the water so that you get a better stick. In other words, the water molecules can contact 
other surfaces better. I don't think you really need it in uh, um, cast iron blocks with cast iron, iron heads, um, but it doesn't hurt that I'm aware of, and I've been running it in the TJ for now. Because initially, after putting the, the Edelbrock head on, uh, I did notice about a five degree rise, and that could have been due to the uh, design of the head and the, the additional power it produced, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or the fact that aluminum doesn't. It's funny, aluminum itself cools better than cast iron, okay. but as far as transferring heat to the water, <clears throat> okay, that, that makes glass sense. layer. And so uh, I use that to help increase the thermal transfer. And <clears throat> I dropped right back down into the 195s. Uh, it does help also in the aluminum radiators. Now, truthfully, a lot of your better antifreezes have that already in them. Okay. Okay. But not all of them. And not all. And you don't know when it's in there, when it's discontinued. Um, it's another one of those products that you can use too much. Okay. You know, for mine, it, and they only sold it in pint bottles, and I only needed a cup for the volume of my radiator. Uh, and no, it doesn't have to be refreshed, only if you flush and refill. So some of these things aren't, they actually have science behind them. And again, do they work? Yeah. Are they absolutely needed? No, probably not. Um, <clears throat> but when you're willing to dig in and experiment a little, a little, you might be able to help a couple of degrees here, a couple of degrees there. And as you mentioned earlier in the show, we're here in Florida, folks. We're under a heat dome right now, which is a stupid name for, well, it's not a stupid name. It's just a, a crazy thing that we're sitting in. It's holding humidity on top of us. Our actual air temperatures are a couple of degrees down. We should be at 94 average. We're at 92. But the feel like, because of the humidity, and the humidity affects the heat transfer levels as well, is somewhere up. 106, 108 any given day. Yeah. And yes, I know you guys in Texas. I have very good friends that live in Texas. They'll tell you, <laughs> yeah, we're that way every day in the middle of winter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, but, you know, you just so you, you add mixtures or, you know, kind of a game. But yeah, you mix them at your own risk because mm -hmm. nobody tests their admixture against your admixture versus his admixture. So you <laughs> may end up turning your, and that's the thing. If you put, let's say, he did a water wetter with an anti-leak. Oh, that's a good old bars leak. <laughs> yeah, so you may end up with jello in your radiator. <laughs> it is possible. So Yeah, you know, like Kevin was saying, when people say, uh, it, was, it was a Facebook meme, but it was funny. They go, I think about coming to Florida, what's it like? Have you ever been cremated? No, the uh, <laughs> but sometimes, you know, again, it, like Kevin will tell you, I go out and take Gunner for a walk at night, you know, and I tell you, there's, there's nothing like stepping outside in July, Florida weather and having yourself a nice breath or a nice small slice of fresh air, you yes. know, <laughs> a cup of it in our case here. But uh, no, uh, another little thing too, I, I got to go, since we're on this diatribe and I don't remember what show we covered it last, if we even ever did. And another old school thing that does kind of, and I, I, as Kevin and I talk, sometimes these synapses just fire and they're good ones. Good old boy says, "Hey, I, do you, what's your your thermostat range on your thermostats? Because I need a uh, I, I need one about you know I need a one sixty five. And I'm like, well, that it only comes with one number, sir. It's it's this isn't uh, O'Reilly's. This is you know Toyota offers one temperature. That's it. He's like, well, I want to go to a one sixty because I want my engine to run cooler because I uh, my trans temps. I heard if you if you lower your engine coolant temps, your trans temp will lower. And I'd rather burn a little extra gas than uh, than burn a transmission. And I raised an eyebrow, saying, "Sir, on your newer fuel injected vehicle, if you you're going to cause more problems than not, because the vehicle is designed to run at 195 degrees to keep carbon and uh, sludge yep. and whatnot builds up. Kevin probably has the technical terms for it. But yep. um, I tried telling the guy that, and you thought I had lobsters crawling out of my ears. He didn't want to hear that. He wanted to, quote, save his transmission. So I'm like, okay, cool. Have a nice day. Any truth to that, Kevin? I mean, I, I, yes and no. If you lower the engine's temperature, since the most automotive radiators have the transmission cooler in the engine cooling radiator, and just over in side in the side tank, so the so the engine and the transmission kind of run at the same temperature. Um, however, dot 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 dot. One ninety 
195 is where the most transmission manufacturers want it to run. <clears throat> so cooling it down isn't going to help. And if you want to cool the radiator more, don't make your engine suffer. Just put a transmission cooler in line. Don't replace the connection up to the radiator. And I'll explain that in a minute. Just go into the line coming out, what they call the hot feed line, that's coming from the transmission up to the front of the car, and put one of those small supplemental derailleurs or one of those other brand of radiator coolers in under there to knock the temperature down before it gets to the automotive radiator. Second of all, why you don't want to take that radiator out is that they are making transmissions with more gears and more efficient and they don't like being cold. So they use the radiator temperature as the engine comes up a lot quicker than the transmission does in terms of temperature. If you if you have a truck like I do with a diesel, it's got both the transmission gauge and the engine gauge. The engine will be up to fully operating temp, and the transmission will go, huh? Uh, <laughs> morning, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. The engine's ready to and go. The, uh, the transmission's still putting its flip-flops on. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, the, the that whole cycle is planned, all right? Um now, if your engine's overheating, okay, look at why it's overheating, not yeah. the transmission. Uh, a lot of people are hung up, and, and it's amazing. For people that never listen to their parents, they will believe Grandpa on his, you know, 42 Wombat. <laughs> they have, which, I, which, thought, I thought the Wombat came out in 72. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some of the oldest, most bizarre stuff has hung around, you know, like, like a couple of kittens that you left food out for them one day. They'll never leave. <laughs> we have four pounds of terror now ourselves. Moving on. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, there, there's there's a shred of truth in all of that. That, yes, you uh, a cooler transmission within its operating range. You know, if it's designed to run from 185 to 225 and you run it down at 190, it's probably going to last a little bit longer if you run it right up there at 290. 209, you know, all the time. Uh, but the thing is, is that when you start generating heat in a transmission, unless you're going up the mountains, pulling an RV, lugging it in low gear, where you're not getting as much air over the radiator, and maybe you change to a cheap Chinese cooling fan, electric, that isn't moving air, then, yeah, you're probably going to roast your 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 uh, transmission. But uh, in most cases, when you're up in those gears pulling hard, where you're generating heat in the radiator, you also have enough air going over the radiator to uh, to cool it down. Hmm. You know, that's an interesting yeah. qu question because what one of the other things I, I I wanted to ask you, man, this is like ask Kevin Day real quick, and I promise this might be the last. It's one. It's been that all week, believe yeah. me. Yeah. Not, the, not, not just the podcast. <laughs> um, you know about methanol injection and, and turbocharging and all that kind of stuff. Here's my biggest yep. thing I've seen now. This seems to be a trend on some of the car culture stuff, or, or especially diesels. If you're doing a hard pull up a mountain uh -huh. in, in your pickup truck, you're doing a hard pull. Of course, you know, people are putting misters on their intercoolers to mist and bring down the temperature because they have a, a bucket of ice water in the trunk, and, and they have, like, special spray nozzles, like five of them up front. Yep. Some people have actually kind of asked me at work, saying, you know, what if I put those just to try and get, you know, and, and I mist over the radiator and the transmission cooler that I have that's all separate. You know, do you think that would help if I'm doing a hard pull in a gas engine? I'm like, you know, I don't know. I don't see why it couldn't hurt. But then again, it, it I'm not an engineer. Yeah. It, it can because that's called evaporative cooling, okay. all right? And you ever gone by, by the power plants and, and Big Bend and those, and they have the big white clouds next to the smoky clouds, the darker ones? Mm -hmm. One is the combustion output. The other is evaporative cooling of the entire system. Okay. Um, yes, it can, all right? Uh, however, it's kind of hard to judge it as far as what the performance would be. Because evaporative cooling requires a lot of airflow. It's got to carry away the water uh, so that it's not sitting out there on your radiator literally boiling. <laughs> okay. You know, it is boiling anyway, but you want the thing to, to flip states, like we were talking air conditioning. You want it to go from the liquid state to the gaseous state quickly, get sucked through and blown out. The other thing to say negatively about evaporative cooling in automotive use, where does that water vapor go? Right. Where does your fan... So you saturate with high humidity the inside of your engine compartment. And even if your engine's running hot enough, although I'm sitting here thinking of what that cooler mist would be on the hot aluminum fragile parts, uh, 
and it's blowing all over your alternator, which is electrical. And what about the rest of the body and sheet metal and all that stuff in there that is not hot enough to keep itself cool? So you're going to increase secondary wear and tear from the excess water. It, it's there anyway, trust me, to some degree, because during the rain you're driving through it and you get yeah. evaporative cooling when you're in a rainstorm. Uh, I, from an engineering perspective, I cannot lie and tell you it doesn't help, but I can't quantify how much it helps. That's fair. Is that fair? No, absolutely. You know, That's fair. Um, and what are the collateral problems with it? You know, what are you creating down the line? You know, if you're talking about a, a, a Ford GT 40 where the radiators are exposed and the outlet for air doesn't go back because there's no engine up behind the radiators. It's in the back behind your seat. Mm -hmm. And so they have those one and two big scoops that come up like through the hood. You know what I'm talking about, Scott? Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and if you did evaporative cooling there, well, you just have to run your washer, your wipers all the time. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so there's, you know, there's something to be said for why it's done the way it is. When you see something that's consistent across all the major manufacturers, there's a reason. If there was really something radically better and one dealer or one uh, manufacturer came up with it and suddenly had a massive market share because of that, you, don't you think the rest of them would figure out how to do it too? Oh yeah, like like, uh, like we said the last show that the, the the manufacturers have already got the engine to peak performance, you know peak fuel mileage. If there was a magical drop in whatever you know chemical air filter whatever, they, you'd all be doing it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean the changes. I'll use once again slightly altered. Like people are like, well, you run a snorkel, yeah, but that's not to improve the engine performance. That's so that I don't suck in a bunch of water like I did before I moved and put the snorkel on. Because <laughs> where that, the, you know, if you go back a year or two, I guess it was, no, it might have even three. Oh, yeah, man. Just, wow. Um, we, uh, we had hurricanes come through here um, and flooded several roads. And they were up at places that I go work. You've heard me mention about the, the horse farm that I go out to occasionally and give them help. And they were out of power, and we wanted to get the generators hooked up to the well because horses need water. They don't care if there's a hurricane there. You know, they still want to drink water, and if they don't get it, you know, they don't do really well. So I'm driving out there and uh, had to cross some pretty dang deep water. I took some videos of it, posted it years ago that showed, you know, you couldn't even see the road stripes. You know, the water was up. Uh, over my doorsteps and that kind of thing. And I'm just tooling along, not really thinking about it. And I get up and I actually got through the water and was coming down the other side and the engine started bucking and fussing and fighting and just really unhappy. Um, so uh, I kind of pulled over real quick in the middle of the rain, jumped out, opened the hood and looked and I realized what it was. So I took my air cleaner out and, and drained the water out of that little snot box that Chry Chrysler put in there for the TJs. Um, and it was full of water. It was a half full. It was to the bottom of the filter. So it hadn't actually pulled it through the filter yet, but it was full. And there are drain holes in there if you give it enough time, but I didn't want to drive along with a completely sodden paper filter. Yeah. And so I got on back there. We did the things we had to do. Um, and since in the middle of a major hurricane, part store seemed to be funny about not wanting to be open. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm looking, and we, we took my... Uh, uh, air cleaner element and I took it into the shop at the barn and um, just kind of dried it with any towel piece of paper whatever got it down to a point while we were working on getting the generator hooked up once we had generator I charged up the air compressor and blew air through it until I knew I could get airflow through it and then drove it home on that why didn't I just leave it out I know somebody's going to ask that, so I'll tell you. It was it saved my butt once, you know, being in there, stopping the water flow. I wasn't about to go back out through a hurricane <laughs> yeah. and, and have it again. So that's why I redesigned the intake system on my particular Jeep. Yes, it's a snorkel. Yes, it could theoretically bring in more water, but it doesn't because the TJ has a flaw. For those of you with a later series TJ, you'll know what I'm talking about. The air cleaner is over at the front corner on the passenger side and it has an air horn for the air coming in and it just looks like literally a horn's face mm -hmm. and it moves. It sometimes can point up, they can push it pointing down, they can put it wherever you want. What 
Chrysler missed is the rotation of the four liter is such that the fan picks up water and throws it against the hood violently enough that you actually have a line on the, the hood right above your fan right into that snorkel, you know, right into the air intake horn. And that's what it did. It just blew it in there. Now, in normal rain situations that I'm sure Chrysler planned for, you could do it. It'll throw it in there. It'll go into the bottom of the box that's a very deep box with a small hole, and it'll drain out, you know, and it won't get up to do anything other than dampen the filter. <clears throat> but you're sw- when you're swimming through uh, 18 to 24 inches of water, uh, you might see a little bit more with the <laughs> Yeah, when the fan blades are actually acting like boat <clears throat> propellers, <laughs> see my prior discussion about water damage to the engine. <laughs> Please don't pull your fan into the radiator. Yeah, yes, yes, uh, yeah. If you cross water, go gently, low idle, and don't hit it hard. If you hit it hard, the water hits it hard enough, the fan bends backwards and then starts shredding your belts. If you go in gentle and then floor it because you want to make that big wave that everybody seems to want in the jeep. Your fan baby will flex forward, and you'll and all of a sudden your temperature gauges will go nuts, and you'll go looking. Why am I? How can I be overheating in in this situation? Yeah, because you just drilled through the backside of your radiator. <laughs> you elka bung your fan <laughs> or radiator with your fan. So along those weird situations, I've got one more subject I want to hit mm-hmm. real quick. Guys, you know I often bring you a neat or different tool report when I when I find something that's a little bit different. And what I'm going to do is throw a scenario out to you: is that you know you you're taking stuff off your Jeep, um, and as you know, they're all so easily accessible that you could get to any of them anywhere, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, uh, kind of like the idle air control screw that are back in underneath and behind the injectors and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, of course, they're not the ones that the head strips out. Right. All right, they're the ones that decide to cam out, and your Allen keys die or your screwdrivers die. But there's not enough room to take a regular set of uh, pliers and reach in there. Well, I found out a company. There's actually two of them that I know of. I got one. There's a Japanese company called Vampire, and you may have heard about them. Blah, blah, blah. Exactly. Uh, and they are a beautiful set of guaranteed and warranted pliers. They were under 20 bucks. Um, and, yes, they're available on Amazon like everything is. Uh and what's different about them, they look like a regular set, and I bought the medium set, not the big ones, uh, of finely machined electrician's pliers is the way I describe them. In other words, they don't go down to a needle point. They go to a blunt nose. And there's a reason for that. As you look at them, and, and yes, there's a cutter, and yes, there's serrated uh, half circles or partial circles that are serrated 90 degrees to the line of the pliers between handle to nose, you know, so they're crosswise. But you look at the nose of the pliers. There's a trough going back in. If you close the pliers and look dead at the nose, it's got a hole up the middle. And it's an arched hole. You know, it's not round. It's it's a um, el- elliptical shape. But the serrations are grill, drilled, ground in, I guess would be a better way to put it are ground in front to back. And what these and then they're hardened. And what these are made to do is to reach in with the nose of these pliers and grab a fastener, a bolt of any kind, a wire, a electrical connector that won't come off. You name it. If you don't have the ability to get your fingers in there, you can still reach in with this and it'll grab it. And I went out and tried it. It's like any other high end set of pliers. The teeth are so hard and sharp they will cut into the outer rim of the screw. Now, they're not going to help you on a, on a countersunk because that's below everything, <laughs> side yeah. grot or, or nose. But I looked at this, and I can't tell you how many times I have been reaching up to somewhere that I couldn't even get my fingers into, much less you know, a, a wrench to go sideways. Um, and they really do seem to work. And so they're the vampire uh, inline pliers <clears throat> and uh, – if you're interested, if, you, if you've if you cussed enough at things that you just can't reach, uh, go look them up on Amazon. Um, Knipex makes them as well. And for those of you who know the electrical company Knipex out of Germany, uh, theirs are bigger. They're actually more favored by the electricians of the world uh, doing line jobs, but these would work to some degree. And, and Vampire Tools has larger ones too. Uh, yes, if you do sidebar and, and, and do electrical wiring, this will be absolutely fantastic to grab three wires in, coming out of an electrical box and twist them into a junction rather than trying to twist sideways your trusting nose on. <coughs> so 
just a neat little tool under 20 bucks. And so far, I'll let you know if anything goes wrong, but I've gone out and abused them a few times, and mm-hmm. um, they seem to work really well. And they even came with a bag, didn't they? Yeah, they came with a little tool pouch, a little roll-up tool pouch, which was weird. You get one set of pliers, and you get a tool pouch with four different slots in it. They want I you to keep buying. a little buying. bit suggestive, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you need to fill this up, don't you? Yeah. Probably. Don't forget to buy the set. Yeah, Be the exactly. collector. <laughs> but I was just sitting there thinking of some of those. You remember the little 10 millimeters and 8 millimeters up under the dash when we were doing your your uh, your Jeep's air conditioning replacement? Oh. <laughs> yeah. And this... <laughs> You don't have to worry about it. You can just yeah. reach straight up in there and grab them nose on. Mm-hmm. I played with one of them. What was neat was it holds it secure enough that you can use it to start the screw. Oh. Yeah, I put a screw head in one of them, clamped it. I put a rubber band on the handle so that I could spin it. And it held it in there, and I just went in and went, zzz, 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 got it started, and then, you know, tightened it up with a screwdriver. Very cool. Very so, cool. Yeah, yeah it, kind of a neat little idea. And, and, and I'll throw this out to everyone out there in listener land. Uh, if you've got a neat tool, something a little different in the in the Jeep uh, arena, doesn't even really have to be in the Jeep arena, but you think made your life a whole lot easier working on things like that, you can send us a message, you know, on. On the trail podcast at gmail.com or the Facebook Messenger, which I'm trying to look up a Messenger message real quickly here from a, a listener that sent us one. And uh, also, too, yeah, you can send Carrier Pigeon, uh, care, care of Florida. Watch out, turn well, left at the gator and next to the right stork. Now. This is <laughs> the owls are out hunting right now. Exactly. Uh. <laughs> No, but uh, real quickly, though, I just wanted to say, um, again, uh, uh, thanks to Nick. Uh, he sent us uh, pictures of the, um, the uh, did you do, what would we call those things again? Catch cans, about his catch can setup and all that. So if you guys find information that you'd like to send us or co- comments, questions about the show, or, you know, again, just, again, one of those things on the, tra- on the trail podcast at gmail.com, or like I said, the Facebook Messenger. Now that I don't have my phone in my hand, I'm not trying to find someone's name. <laughs> That's true. So, that's true. But uh, All right. Well, I think we've wandered around mm-hmm. over, under, and, you know, down into Narnia and back a few times. But that's exactly. what Jeeps are good for. Um, and with any so, luck, we will have a show that's going to be on the uh, first. Kevin is going to be doing some traveling a little bit. So, uh, again, we may have a little disruption getting a show out, but I'm sure we'll be okay. But uh, I think I think if, if we're late, it'll only be a day or two. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm coming back before that. It's just you having time to, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, but with that again, we, we thank all the, the the Facebook messengers, the the emails you guys have sent, the likes and uh, on our, our Facebook pages and stuff like that. Again, don't forget the Florida Trail Team Challenge is coming up. Yep. Um, we also have uh, the uh, Jeep Toberfest, and we also have Crawling for the Fallen coming up. Those are the thing. Those are the three oh, yeah, big we events. Have to, we have to get together and and do that recording. Yes, I think uh, that one's going to have to be a face to face rather no. than a computer face to computer. No, no. That's a that's a face to face one for sure. Absolutely. Uh, the other favor I've got to ask of all you guys out there that listen to us regularly is share us. Mm-hmm. We'd really appreciate that. Is doesn't cost you a dime, but if you just ask somebody or let them know that we're out here. Um, we'd be be happy to hang out. We're kind of one of the legacy shows. A lot of other Jeep shows are beginning to quiet down a little bit, and some mm-hmm. of our good friends have kind of gone on to indefinite hiatuses. We don't plan to do that for the moment, uh, but uh, listenership is king. Uh, we've mm-hmm. never asked you guys to actually pay for us. Yes, you can donate through, you know, uh, uh, PayPal. Not PayPal. What is Patreon. it? Um, Patreon, mm-hmm. if you choose, but we don't even ask for that as other than you go. But listenership is what makes it uh, worth us staying on the air. And mm-hmm. if you like what you hear, give it a share. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, the numbers definitely help. It, it helps it seem worth it. And again, it, but as always, you know, again, as Kevin and I talk about this many times, be cool. To, welcome the new Jeepers. Be cool. If they're into ducks, great. If they're not into ducks, that's okay. But just be cool and be nice to people. And speaking of ducks. Mm-hmm. Um, Allison uh, Parliament, the founder of uh, the uh, the whole uh, Duck Duck uh, Go uh, genre, yeah, uh, unfortunately passed away. Uh, her family requests some privacy and time. This has been about a month now. Um, I've met Allison at a couple of events, and she's a wonderful lady. And I'm sorry that she's decided that, that whatever brought it to her. I haven't heard, so I can't even comment on what it is. But I know that um, she brought a little spark, even if you didn't care for the ducks. you got to admit, it was a little bit of fun whimsy to come out and find a little rubber ducky on your Jeep. 
Yeah, I guess the 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 story is that she started around 2020 um, with people being uh, yep. uh, and and this is a little bit of smile. He come out to your vehicle and there's a duck on there to, to to give you that little bit of human touch and a smile. And again, I remember when Dory got her first duck, the Jeep Beach, before she passed. She was the happiest person, and to me that that's king. You know, again, we all have our own things, but again, just be the if people like it, just do it. You know, what I mean, just. We're all gonna. It's it's a polarizing topic, but to me, I I will always default to making someone smile and laugh, because again, at the end of the day, it's all what it's about. It's about jeeps, friends, camaraderie. You know, we all know that you know that that Toyotas are there to be pulled out. You know, um, <laughs> so again, it's it's one of those deals. <laughs> so yes, I am the enemy at work. Everyone's like, hey, it's that Jeep guy. I was like, <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. But anyways. Uh, but, no, but anyway, just uh, keep uh, keep Allison's parents and family in, mm-hmm. in your thoughts and prayers, um, and uh, we wish uh, the best for her family and uh, hope that uh, wherever she's gone, she is uh, happy and well cared for. Absolutely that way. Well, as with always, that, it's like it's time we put the jeep in four low and hit the trail and take nothing but pictures, memories, and our trash when we leave the trail because we want to make sure we leave these trails open. For our gener- new generations of off-roaders, whether you drive a Bronco, Toyota, Jeep, or whatever, and also to make sure you take your pictures, memories, and leave nothing but your trash. If I said that twice already, I apologize, but it's no, an important no, message. No, you just forgot the other one is for those of us with the old Jeeps, remember to lock your hubs in. Yes, yes, <laughs> and tread lightly. So with that, I think it's time we bid adieu and check it out out for the next show of show 212. 212. That's close to dangerously close to 2112. Go rush. But anyways... With that, you all have a great time. Again, email us with any questions. Have a wonderful one. Bye. Bye. Proceeding has been provided for entertainment only. Proper service and repair procedures are vital to the safe, reliable operation of all motor vehicles, as well as personal safety of those performing those repairs. Standard safety procedures and precaution, including the use of safety goggles and proper tools and equipment, should be followed at all times to eliminate the possibility of personal injury or improper service which could damage the vehicle or compromise its safety. What he said. <laughs> Thanks a lot for listening, guys. You guys have a great day. Bye. <laughs> this has been a Bent Axel Media Production. Bye.